what if people start understanding more about their biases, about how they perceive the world? You know, that this is obviously done in colleges and universities, in psychology courses, as well as in biology courses and uh, things like that. But, you know, it's not as though human beings are incapable of changing their worldview based on evidence. And that gives me hope that as we move forward, we'll be able to learn more about, um, about the rest of the world, internalize not just that information, but also why we are being pessimistic and negative. What do you think about that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm listening and I'm thinking it through. I, I'm also wondering, I would say that learning this material has made me, has lifted some of the existential weight from me. Things aren't as bad as they're trumpeted to be. In fact, they're quite a bit better and they're getting better. And so we're doing a better job than we thought. There's more to us than we thought. We're adopting our responsibilities as stewards of the planet rapidly. We are moving towards improving everyone's life it, it, I lived under an apocalyptic shadow my whole life. I mean, I don't want to complain about that too much because <laughs> I lived in a very rich place and I had all sorts of advantages and all of that. But the apocalyptic narrative was still extraordinarily powerful and demoralizing. And it, it looks to me that there are reasons to doubt its validity on all sorts of dimensions. And I'm not sure what that will do to people, but hopefully it'll make us more optimistic and and positive and less paranoid and afraid and happier with who we are and but still willing to participate in improving the future and to lift some of the weight off young people who are constantly being told that the planet is going to burn to a cinder in the next 20 years and 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 well that's not happening that's not happening and and people who push that agenda in the newspapers and elsewhere are completely irresponsible and cruel but that leads to that leads to perhaps the the, the final point from from my end. Like you, I have become uh, much more optimistic, uh, not much more happy in my own personal life once I realized that so much uh, around me I didn't have a right to complain about, and I should be grateful for. I should be grateful for mm -hmm. that I'm not a that I'm not a peasant in 17th century, or you know, or a, a and appreciative of, of what's brought us here. And that's the key, is that people who do not understand the crucial role that political and economic liberalization, opening, inclusion, has played in launching the Industrial Revolution, uh, showing us the path, the rest of the world, a path to, to prosperity. If they don't understand that everything we have is underpinned by a certain economic and political system, both of them terribly imperfect, terribly imperfect. But look at the alternative. Look at the difference between Chile, the extraordinary success of that country after it embraced free markets and the collapse of Venezuela where people eat kid, kid, uh, cats and dogs. Look at the difference between Botswana, which is a relatively free economy, and its neighbor, Zimbabwe, where people have experienced hyperinflation of 96 trillion percent. Look at the difference between East and West Germany, between, um, between the United States and the USSR. Look at the difference between North and South Korea. If you, really, you just called it the worst possible regime in the world, I think you're right on that. I'm pretty sure you're right on that. And uh, that regime is still out there. If you have a problem with liberal democracy and, and uh, competitive enterprise, fix those problems incrementally, one by one. Don't burn down the system because the alternatives, as you can see in the world, are much worse. Let's go through the trends here. So the first one, so the book is structured so that on the right hand page, there's a graphic, a graph, um, showing progress across time, time or change across time, a variety of different um, trends, let's say. The first one, the first trend is the great enrichment. And uh, tell us what that means and, and what it signifies. 
So the chart, which you may be able to show at some point in the future, looks like a hockey stick, which is to say that for all of our recorded history, let's say going back 4000 BC, but we can estimate even, even further back in time. There it is, the hockey stick of human prosperity. Um, the, the line has flatlined. Uh, it is estimated that prior to the Industrial Revolution in the uh, late 17 and early 1800s, um, global economy grew by about 0.1% per year, which is to say that to double your prosperity would have taken thousands of years. Um, as late as 1900, which is to say the presidency of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Queen Victoria was on the throne, the, uh, the globe produced roughly $3 trillion in output. Um, I've, I, 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 this is all inflation adjusted. So $3 trillion in output, the entire globe. In 2018, it was $121 trillion. So from $3 trillion to $121 trillion in a scope of 100 years adjusted for inflation. And if the growth that we have experienced, the growth rate that we have experienced over the last 100 years continues into 2100, uh, the world will produce $600 trillion in output, real inflation adjusted output. Over the next 80 years, the globe could produce six times more value than it is currently producing if we maintain the current economic growth rate. And do you think that's an optimistic projection or a conservative projection? That's what leads us back to the original point that we discussed. It very much depends on economic policies and political stability. Um, if you don't have civil wars around the world uh, then uh, and, and government change hands in a peaceful and predictable way, um, then we should be okay when it comes to political stability. When it comes to economics, we are seeing a surprising and, uh, to be quite frank, well, to be frank, surprising and almost inexplicable um, renewed interest in uh, more restrictive economic policies uh, from socialism on the left to hardcore protectionism on the right. Um, and, and if our economic growth rate falls from 1.82% that we have experienced over the last year to 0.1%, which we have experienced over the previous 10,000 years, then it will take us 6,000 years to get from $100 trillion to $200 trillion. So the, so the most remarkable thing about this is, is, is exactly the hockey stick shape. It's, as you pointed out, nothing at all happened until eight, the mid 1800s, essentially. And then all of a sudden, things improved so rapidly that it's virtually incomprehensible. It's, it's, it's a miracle. It, it is the most important question in economics. Um, what happens in the late 1700s, early 1800s that produces that hockey stick effect? And just to clarify, there have been in human history periods of economic efflorescence, flourishing, uh, but they were usually restricted to small parts of the world and they were usually, they usually petered out. So for example, Song China has produced some remarkable um, technological discoveries and it appeared to be a, a time of relative plenty compared to other countries in the world. But that petered out when Song, Ch Song Dynasty was replaced by the Ming Dynasty. Similarly, the Roman Empire appears to have been a place that was largely at, at peace internally and quite prosperous, but that came to an end in uh, 467 or whenever that happened, uh, when, when, when Rome fell. So there are these periods uh, that you can have um, uh, prosperity. Also, let's stay with Europe. I mean, Europe has experienced the, the greatest century of peace and prosperity between 1814, the end of Napoleonic Wars, and 1914, the breakout of the First World War, which slaughtered tens of millions and destroyed a, a, a lot of wealth. So, uh, you know, economic progress um, can certainly take a knock and it can take a time to, to recover. But in order for it to recover, you have to rediscover the reasons why you had high economic growth rates in the first place. 
despite more people, despite more urbanization, despite the hypothetically decreasing prevalence of resources, despite all of those hypothetical problems, there's been a 70% decline in basic global commodity prices adjusted for wages from 1980 till 2018. Stunning, right? Not what anyone was that's, predicting in the 1960s by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So even though the population of the world has increased by something like 70%, uh, the prices of natural resources have declined by 70%, which means that every additional person born on the planet has made things cheaper for us by about 1%. And nobody saw that coming. Um, right, that should be said 50 times. Right, because it's so it's so not what anyone thinks. More people means more wealth. That's exactly right. And that's you know, I've also seen that more people means more ecological preservation, and so does more wealth, because richer people care more about the environment. And and so you see that perverse uh, occurrence too, that as G once GDP gets to the point where people aren't scrabbling around trying to stay alive, so maybe five thousand dollars per capita all of a sudden environmental concerns start to manifest themselves. And so it looks like we could have more people and make them richer faster, and that would be better for the planet. No, that's absolutely right. The cleanest environment in the world is in uh, advanced countries, uh, in, in uh, Western uh, capital societies. Um, uh, when, you, when you see tremendous attack on, on the environment is in poor countries. Uh, you know, when the Venezuelan economy collapsed, they started eating animals in zoo. In Zimbabwe, when their economy collapsed, uh, they started slaughtering the wildlife. You know, if, if it's a choice between killing a giraffe or having my baby die, I know what I have to do, right? Um, but so, so for the longest time, um, people thought that if, if population grows, we are going to run out, out of resources. And this is not what has happened. We have more resources. Resources are cheaper, but that in itself is an indication that they are more abundant than, uh, uh, than before. Because, of course, human beings are not just consumers of resources. We're not just destroyers of resources. We're also creators of resources. Human beings are producers of ideas. Yes, and on average, we produce more than we consume. Otherwise, we would die. Well, that's exactly right. And that's what people like Thomas Malthus or Paul Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich at uh, Stanford University were worried about. They freaked out. Two, generation of, two generations of people, or at least population. And we still, haven't, we still haven't recovered from that. No, it's we still, still haven't recovered from that. Apocalyptic narrative. No one believes, if I tell my students, we're going to peak at 9 billion and we can handle that, and then the population is going to decline, no one believes that. If, if you say that, well, we've got richer as more people have been born rather than poor because brain power exceeds uh, consumption, essentially, especially as people have got healthier, and, and their IQ has increased, which is something we could talk about as well. Um, none of this is part of the general uh, apocalyptic narrative. So uh, population uh, without immigration in Western Europe will continue to decline. Um, uh, our numbers are still going up because obviously we have a huge, uh, huge immigration, but, but, but women are not having that many babies. Now, is this going to be a blessing or is it going to be a, a, a potential problem? Well, it could be a potential problem because, because uh, human beings are the producers of ideas and ideas lead to innovation. And uh, if a genius is one out of a billion or one out of a million, then the fewer millions of people you have born, the fewer geniuses are going to be born. Uh, and that in itself, uh, and, and that, that to me is a, is a major concern. But of course, in Western countries, we have promised so much to the future generations that are supposed to, that are supposed to be paid for by, uh, by, by children who are born in the future, that if those children are not being born, who is going to pay off that debt in the future? Who's going to pay for all those retirees? Those questions should also be uh, answered. Yes, it's quite surprising to note that one of the more pressing social problems in 100 years might be that there aren't enough people, rather than there are too many. Mm -hmm. Could easily be the case. Right. So by, that, by then, perhaps we'll have uh, robotics uh, to help us a lot. Um, 
you know, take. Yes, and who knows, right? We can't even think yeah. about problems 100 years yeah. in the future because it's going to be so different 100 years from now that nothing we could possibly talk about right now is going to be relevant. I mean, God only knows. We can't, we can't, we don't have a five year horizon or a 10 year horizon given the rate of technological change, let alone 100 years. So, but the, the moral of this story is um, it doesn't look like we're going to overpopulate the planet to the point where we're going to destroy all our natural resources, the planet, and everyone's going to starve. That doesn't seem to be in the cards. So unless we make catastrophic and likely avoidable errors. So we're richer by far um, in terms of productivity and quality of products and absolute poverty has declined precipitously. Commodity prices have fallen. We're not going to overpopulate the world in any cataclysmic sense. Everyone has increasingly more than enough to eat. Um, there's more land for nature and that trend seems upward. More people are moving to urban areas and that's advantageous rather than disadvantageous. There are more democracies and so we're better governed. We're more peaceful and we're less likely to die from catastrophes. And I should point out to everyone who's listening, that really only scrapes the surface of the topics that are covered in this remarkable book. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, the authors delve into comparatively micro trends in detail, discussing such things, which I would love to discuss, and perhaps we should continue this um, at some point in the not too distant future, um, such things as the precipitous decline in computational power, and that's in its infancy, um, access to electricity. Uh, you mean uh, computational price of computation, yeah. Yes, yes, well, and, and, and pure power and, and accessibility and mobile technology and right, right. lighting costs and uh, decline in the cost of renewable resources and clean drinking water and better sanitation. And um, I'm just leafing through the book, internet access, and so that's education and that will get better and better. Um, But other than that, <laughs> yeah. So, so let's close out with this. Um, I've done three podcasts, I think, in the last couple of months that were aimed at bringing this information to to a broader audience. Um, there, there seems to some degree to be a saleability issue, or maybe it's just too soon. And, and like all this good news, in some sense, is relatively recent, and the word may just not have spread. Um, any ideas about what could be done to counter the pessimistic and apocalyptic narratives that seem to dominate the public landscape? Well, you are doing it right now by interviewing me. I am doing it by having this website, which is made all the more useful by the fact that we didn't come up with this data. It's freely available on many different platforms uh, around the world. If you think that I'm full of it, go to our world in data, go to the World Bank, go to the IMF, go to Eurostat. If, if, if you are interested in the, in the state of the world, there's plenty of data out there that can show you that the state of the world is much better than, than it is. That is a great place to end. Thank you very much. And I'm there's so many more things we could talk about and hopefully we'll get an opportunity to do exactly that. Some of the microanalysis because there are comparative microanalysis because there's so much data in this book that's fascinating. It's an endless source of optimistic revelation that's also realistic. And so I hope many people buy it and put it on their coffee table and share it with their friends and, and, and lift some of the unnecessary burden of human shame and guilt from their shoulders. Well, I'm uh, grateful for that, uh, for those kind words about my book. I'm deeply grateful to you for having me on your show. And I'm delighted that uh, you're doing well and uh, hopefully we'll be doing even better in the future.